You know, I have a lot of hobbies in life. I'm a musician, a baker, a martial artist. I love to exercise and play with my dogs, and of course, work on my YouTube channel. But out of all the hobbies I enjoy, what might be my most favorite hobby out of all of them, believe it or not, is actually reading. I love to read. I read at least one book a month. In fact, every January, I like to map out my reading for the entire year. Last month, I just finished reading Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, and this month I'm reading The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. And through the books that I've read, I've come across some of the coolest opening lines written by different authors, and some of the most interesting introductions to stories I've ever experienced. I'll go ahead and share some of them with you. Here's a popular one. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Of course, this one is from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, and it's used to show that we can experience some of the best feelings in life while also living through some of the worst times. It's pretty deep, actually. Here's another one. There are two dangerous things we can do when studying demons. This is where the quote starts. One is to believe in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. That one's from C.S. Lewis's book called The Screwtape Letters. He's saying, although it's dangerous not to believe that de demons exist, it's also just as dangerous to believe in demons and then become obsessed with them. I'll give you one more. Women and children knew deep in themselves that no misfortune was too great to bear if their men were whole. This one's from The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. It means that men are the foundation for the family, and as long as the man of the house is strong and stable, then the mother and the children will always feel secure no matter what they go through. It always amazes me how incredibly deep some writers think. They have so much wisdom and knowledge, and the way that they're able to express it onto the page is very impressive. But out of all of the opening lines and first chapters of any book that I've read, there's always one opening line that impresses me more than any of the other ones. It is the most profound opening line to any book that has ever been written. And people often just gloss over it. It's really only three words, but in those three words, it teaches us some of the most important lessons that we can ever learn about life itself. And the opening line is this, in the beginning, from the book of Genesis, written by Moses and inspired by God himself. That opening line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, tells us almost everything that we need to know. For starters, it teaches us that God has been around since the beginning of all things. It also teaches us that God is all-powerful, since he was able to create the heavens and the earth, and it also shows us that God is loving enough to create more things to exist alongside himself. And the opening chapter in the Bible will tell us even more. We learn in the opening chapter of Genesis that God created everything good. We learn that God loved us so much that he created us in his image. And he even gave us a purpose to rule over the earth. A couple of chapters later, we learn that unfortunately, we weren't good enough to live up to his standard and we fell into sin. But even though we fell into sin, God still loved us so much that he had a plan to save us as early as Genesis 3.15. And this sets the course for what is by far the most incredible and perfect story ever written, the Holy Bible. I think it's important for us to sometimes view God as a writer or as an author. In fact, God is the ultimate author. And he's the only author that actually matters, in fact, because all of human experience ultimately comes from him. All goodness, truth, and beauty comes from God himself. And it is perfectly expressed in his nature and in the personhood of Jesus Christ. And so the title of the sermon today is The Author of Life. We're going to take a look at how God wrote out an entire story that spans over the course of thousands and thousands of years. We're going to see that not only did God write such a long story, he also made sure to write himself as the main character. He is the hero of the story. And just like any other hero in any other story, God had to save someone and overcome something. And the one God saved in his story is you. And the thing he overcame was sin and death itself. So I'm going to go over three main points in the sermon that I think will really help you view God's plan and his story in a different way. And we'll start off with the first point, which is Jesus Christ is the author of life. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, verse 15, to get into my first point. The title of the sermon actually appears in this verse. In this passage, the Apostle Peter just finished healing a crippled man. 
performing a miracle in front of many people. Here, Peter tells the Israelites who are watching that they're responsible for having Jesus Christ killed. And Peter refers to Jesus in many different ways. He calls him the God of Abraham, the God of our fathers, and the Holy and Righteous One. But the one title that is very interesting, mainly because it's so unique, is the one found in verse 15 when Peter says this, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. The author of life is a very interesting title to give to Jesus Christ. Peter describes him as an author, one who writes a story about life itself. In other words, he is the writer of all things. Now, some translations will say prince of life instead of author of life. But when we look at the original Greek word here, it's a word pronounced archegos, which means to originate or author something. So archegos would mean the one who authors the beginning or the one who originates the beginning, which is why it's more accurate to say the author of life here. God himself is the archegos of life or the author of life. He has written a story about all things that have ever been, are, and ever will be. It is a story that we have written down in the scriptures, and it is a story that we are living out and experiencing right now. When we read through the Bible, we're seeing the product of God's divine scribe writing out his eternal plan. And just like any story, God's plan and the stories in the Bible have all sorts of characters. We read about heroes like Moses, Abraham, and King David, but we also read about villains like Satan and the Antichrist. We don't just read about characters though. We also read about different genres. All of these stories explore the nature of good and evil. They even have plot twists too, like when you think that the Israelites are about to be destroyed by the Egyptians only for Moses to part the Red Sea at the very last second. You read intense action scenes like when David slays Goliath and chops off his head. And you'll also read a little bit of horror too, like when we read about very real cases of demonic possession and more importantly, God's victory over demons. But the most amazing thing that you will read, I think, is the tragedy that is found in the Gospels, telling the story of a perfect, righteous, and innocent man who was unjustly condemned to death and crucified in front of his own mother. When you read through the Bible, it is clear that there is no better author than God himself. He is the greatest writer because he understands the human experience better than anyone, while also knowing what is good, true, and beautiful. And there is another reason why God is the greatest author ever, which is this. He is the only writer who was able to jump into his own book and live and interact with the very people that he created. God didn't just create a world full of incredible stories. He also jumped right into the story himself in the person of Jesus Christ to live amongst the very people that he created. And there is no author who will ever be able to do that. Only God can. And God lived amongst the very people he created because he loves us, which is actually what we read in the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 14, when it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We see in this verse that God wrote a story that he himself was able to jump right into and dwell amongst the very characters that he wrote. You know, this is actually one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, John chapter 1. It has a lot of great revelation in it, which is why we should probably back up even further to the very first verse in the chapter, John 1.1. 1, 1. It's a popular verse, which goes something like this. In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This brings me back to the original point I was making earlier. The Apostle Paul called Jesus Christ the author of life because he is the originator, the archegos of all things. And we read this here too. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By the way, the root version of the Greek word archegos is actually used here for the words in the beginning. So Jesus Christ is the archegos or the author of life because he existed in the arche or the beginning. In other words, Jesus Christ is the author of life because he's the embodiment of God who always was, is, and always will be. Amen. And so as the author of life, God has written a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an ending. 
Over the past few weeks, my pastor had been preaching about the end times, which is important on this topic here, because when we read about the end times, this implies that there was a beginning to the story, a middle of the story, and the end, which is coming soon. In fact, God himself asserts that he is in control of the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story in Revelation 22, 13, which reads, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So how can God be both the first and the last, and the beginning and the end? Well, God can be all of these things all at once, because as we read earlier in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, God existed, and exists today, and He will always exist. The author of life has a story that has been given to us in the Bible, and that we are a part of too, that has always been written, and that already has an ending in place. It's an ending that God has full control of. There is nothing that you can do to change that ending. There is nothing that you can do to add to his story or take away from it. If you could do something to change the story, then it wouldn't be perfect. But we already know that God is perfect, which is why we know that his plan and his story will not change. Which leads me to my second point. God's story is inevitable. As much as we like to think that our ideas and our plans are always the best thing, the reality is that God's plan is always the best course for us, even if we don't like it, and even if that plan sometimes involves some level of pain for us. When I think about the end times and when I read difficult parts to interpret in the Bible like Revelation and Daniel, I like to take the advice given to us in Proverbs 19.21, which says this, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. As much as we like to take pride in our plans, ultimately it is God's story that will prevail over any plan that we may want for ourselves. God's story is inevitable. It is unchangeable. That doesn't mean that we don't have choices in our lives. It just means that God's plan will prevail over anything we try to do to overthrow it. Even the most stubborn people who refuse to acknowledge God's sovereignty over all things will one day have no choice but to admit that he was right all along. They will one day have no choice but to surrender to God's mighty power. We read this many times in the scriptures, actually, but let's read one example in Philippians where the Apostle Paul says this, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I want to take a moment to talk about this verse and really focus on the key words, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. One of the most controversial things I will ever say about studying the Bible is that not everything in the Bible is supposed to be taken literally when you read it. I know that when I say that, it really upsets some of my brothers and sisters in Christ because not taking everything literally in the Bible can be a very dangerous thing too. But the reality is that if you are watching this video and you have at least one eyeball, then you also believe that it shouldn't be taken literally when Jesus Christ says, if your eye causes you to stumble and sin, pluck it out and throw it away. Everyone here, myself included, has sinned because of something that we've watched or looked at at some point. But I don't think anybody here has plucked out their eye because of it either. And the reason that you haven't plucked out your eye is because we know that Jesus wasn't being literal when he said this. He was trying to convey a broader message that was to say that if there's something in your life that is causing you to sin, it's better to do away with it completely. And he uses this method of exaggeration to really make sure that it sticks with the listener. And so when I first read verses like these, claiming that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the theologian in me first wondered, is this really supposed to be taken literally though? I thought to myself, I mean, surely there will be some people out there who refuse to bow down to God, right? I mean, I've met some really, really stubborn atheists and bitter people who I would imagine would be so upset when they finally look at God in the face that they would still refuse to bow down to Him and confess that He is their Lord and Savior. But it is very clear that this verse is being as literal as any writer could possibly be. One of the reasons we know it's literal is because it comes out so many times in the Bible. Here are a few examples. We just read Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, which says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Meanwhile, though, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, God himself says this, Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. And of course, the Apostle Paul quotes these same words God spoke when he writes in Romans 14, 11, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So we know that this message has to be taken very literally because the Bible quotes it several times in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And these words were spoken by God himself. And so what does that mean exactly, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Well, it means this. Even the most stubborn people you know, with the most hardened hearts and arrogant spirits, will one day bow down to the Almighty God and will swear and confess that He is Lord. It is inevitable. Everyone you know and all the evil people you read about, Hitler, Genghis Khan, even Buddha himself, will all bow down and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, and there's not a thing that they can do about it. God's plan for all things will come to fruition and will not be broken. There isn't any amount of intelligence that any man or woman has that can make God's plan any better. There is no amount of philosophy or moral theories out there that will surpass the eternal wisdom of the Lord. His story will not be undone, and there is no other story that would have resulted in something better than what God already knows is yet to come. And yet, there are still many people today in our world who believe that they know better than God himself. They scoff at the reality of goodness and reject the idea of truth. There are those today who would rather reject God's truth and order of the universe and instead create their own version of what they consider to be good, which is always going to end up bad. There will come a day when God humbles all of these types of people. In fact, there is no man or woman who has lived, is alive right now, or ever will live that has enough pride and arrogance to reject God when they finally see him one day face to face but by then it'll be too late. I think that a great passage that illustrates this is in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 12 and then a few verses later in 17 through 18, which reads this, The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. Then in 17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted that day, and the idols will totally disappear. It's important to know that whenever the Bible uses the phrase, the day of the Lord, it's almost always referring to either God's day of judgment or the time when God will one day reconcile himself with his creation in the end times. And so what we read here is that there will indeed come a time when God addresses all the arrogance and pride of mankind. Those who refuse to take accountability for their sin, those who blame everybody else but themselves, those who refuse to acknowledge that God is the ultimate authority, all of these people will be humbled and brought low. And it's important for us to not be included as part of this type of judgment. If you're prideful, it's important to understand this about pride, which is that the most dangerous thing about pride is that when you are prideful, you're so busy looking down at other people that you forget to look up at God himself. And in the day of the Lord, God will remind the prideful and the arrogant men and women just how low they are in comparison to him. So God's story is inevitable. God's story will always have the best possible outcome. It includes a plan for redemption and the reconciliation between us and God himself. And there is nothing that we can do to add to his plan. And there's also nothing that we can do to take away from it either. Nothing you do will help his plan. Nothing you do will stop his plan. And nothing you say will make it better or change it. His plan is inevitable and unchangeable. But most of all, it is perfect. His story will continue on either with you or without you. And yet, for some reason, despite the fact that we can't do anything to affect his plan, God still wants you to be a part of his story, which is my third and final point. God wants you to be a part of his story. There are many places in the Bible that describe this, but I want to specifically look at Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22. Here, Jesus Christ is gathering the disciples for the first time. And this is what we read. 
While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So in this passage, we can notice two main things. The first is that Jesus Christ, the author of life, who jumped right into the book that he wrote to live amongst the very people that he created, doesn't command them to follow him. He didn't tell Peter, Andrew, James, and John that they had to or must follow him. What Jesus Christ did instead was he invited them to follow him. Jesus Christ called on them to join him in his story and in his ministry. And the reason for this is because God didn't just write the story of life. He didn't just want to be a part of it, but he also wants you to be a part of it too. It's not enough to simply learn about the lessons of Christ, but what we're called to do is experience it with him. That is what separates Christianity from most other religions, which is that God himself wants a relationship with his creation. He wants to interact with the story that he wrote and the people that he created. And more importantly, he wants you to experience it along with him. The other thing to notice about this passage is the way that the disciples responded. Going back to the passage we just read, the key word to highlight is the word immediately in verses 20 and 22. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The Greek word used here for immediately is eutheos, which means as soon as. In other words, as soon as they received the invitation, they accepted it and followed him. There was no hesitation. And this gives us a lesson today. When God calls on you, it is important for you to answer the call. And of course, God has called on you already and is calling you right now to follow him. The author of life is calling you to enter into his presence and accept your salvation. He is calling you to leave behind what you had before and follow Jesus. Peter and Andrew, they left their nets. James and John, they left their boats and their father. The question you should answer is, what do you have to leave behind? It's impossible to follow God and remain the same person once you've started following him. The transformation we go through as Christians through the works of the Holy Spirit will sanctify us and cleanse ourselves of sin. But in order to do that, in order to join the author of life and be a part of his story, we must turn away from our past selves and accept the new person we are meant to be in Jesus Christ. And there is no more important time to do that than right now. The reality is that we are reaching the end of God's story in the Bible. We know that Jesus Christ will return. But before we reach the climax of the story, God has given us time to make the most important decision for our souls. It's like C.S. Lewis once said, Now is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It won't last forever. We must take it or leave it. This is true. We must either accept God's invitation to live a life that will work toward God's story or act against it. His story is inevitable. It will work out either way. The question is whether or not it will work out for you. It's important to understand that God is so perfect that he doesn't need you or me to progress his story. God can do it however he wants. Jesus Christ didn't need 12 disciples. He could have done the work himself. God didn't need the prophets to proclaim his word in the Old Testament. He could have simply spoken it to everybody as he saw fit. But God loves the world and his creation so much that he wants to include mankind in his plan. God loves you so much that he wants you to be a part of his story and experience it with him. We just read about how the disciples accepted Jesus Christ's invitation to follow him. But the truth is that there are other places in the New Testament where people chose not to follow him. Maybe you remember the rich young man who didn't abandon his possessions to follow Jesus. And of course, Judas Iscariot was a disciple who went back on the invitation from Jesus and betrayed him instead. But the more remarkable thing about Jesus Christ inviting people to follow him is that he asked people from all walks of life. He asked fishermen, a young peasant girl named Mary, a murderer named Moses, a young shepherd boy named David, and even a murderer of Christians named Paul. 
All of these people came from different walks of life. Yet the one thing that they all have in common is they immediately turned away from their past self and accepted the invitation to follow God. They immediately chose to live a life that glorifies God and chose to be a part of his story. And today, you have the same choice too. Jesus Christ is the author of life. He is the Word made flesh, which always was, is, and ever shall be. Jesus Christ has written a story that spans across all of time and had you in mind while he wrote it. It's a story that is inevitable and that didn't require you to be a part of it at all, but God loves you so much that he invites you to be a part of it anyway. God loves you so much that he was willing to write a story that spans over thousands and thousands of years so that way you can have a chance to be with him forever. God loves you so much, in fact, that out of billions and billions of people and throughout all of history, if you were the only person who had ever sinned, Jesus Christ would have still jumped right into the story that he wrote and still would have died for your sake. And just as God had you in mind when he wrote the entire story of the Bible, we should turn away from our sin and allow ourselves to be transformed so that God will also have us in mind when he finally finishes his story and writes the last words, the end. But the thing is that God's story is so beautiful that if you choose to be a part of it and leave your nets and abandon your boats to follow him, we're then granted with eternal life. Which means that the end of the story in the Bible is really just the beginning of all good things that are yet to come. Amen.